slowly start. Hello, everyone. We are pleased to welcome you to this last webinar of the 2024 edition of the Data Collection Webinar Series before our summer break, organized by the Data Collection Unit at the UNICEF headquarters. I'm Tatiana Karaulat, Statistics Specialist in Data Collection Unit in UNICEF HQ. This uh, 2024 uh, edition of the series focuses on multiple indicator cluster survey program. We are delving into specific aspects of mixed implementation at country level, uh, exploring new modules, tools, and futures, as well as explore various household survey facets. Webinars are held about every two weeks on Wednesdays from 8 to 9.30 a.m. as Eastern Standard Time. Uh, today webinar is entitled Closing Gender Data Gaps for Children Through Mix. But just some uh, housekeeping rules. We have scheduled about an hour and 30 minutes today, including question and answers. Throughout the webinar, please remain muted and kindly write your questions in the Q&A box. We will try and group uh, all your questions and direct them to the presenters during the Q&A session. This webinar, as always, is being recorded and will be available on the Mix YouTube channel together with the past webinars. Recording will also be available on the units of SharePoint site for those colleagues who have access. You can find the links for both of these in the announcement that you received for this webinar. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, today's webinar is entitled Closing Gender Data Gaps for Children Through Mix. And we are really happy to have uh, a three colleague today with us. We have Satvika Chalasani, Senior Advisor uh, for Gender Equality in Program Group in UNICEF. We have Lauren uh, Pendolfelli, Statistic and Monitoring Specialist in Data and Analytics Section in UNICEF. And we have Eva Quintana, Statistics Specialist in Data and Analytics Section UNICEF. I'm leaving to Satvika to, uh, for opening remarks and then Lauren and Eva to uh, do the presentation. Please go ahead, Satvika. Thank you so much, Tatiana, and welcome everyone to the webinar. We're super excited to be here. My name is Satvika Chalasani. And I sit with uh, the, the gender group of UNICEF, and we work very closely with our data colleagues, uh, particularly our colleagues in the mix. So I'm, I'm super excited to be here. We know that gender equality remains a pressing challenge worldwide. Uh, we're literally 300 years away from achieving uh, complete gender equality globally. Um, and one of the tools we have at our disposal, a very important tool to address that gender gap and to close those gender gaps is data. Uh, gender data has an important role to play in our efforts, in our advocacy with member states, um, to inform policy and program, and to measure our progress. The Secretary General has emphasized gender equality as a key element of his data strategy, as uh, those of you who work on data in the UN system may know. And we know that more data is a consistent ask from member states, whether it's program countries or whether it's donors. Uh, it's really gender data is high up there on people's agenda, even though it may be underinvested. It's a politically important uh, agenda. At UNICEF, we're making several important contributions to fill data gaps together with our sister agencies. And we have lots of tools and opportunities um, within the MIX series. It's really one of the most important assets that we have to, um, to contribute to more knowledge, uh, data, and evidence on gender, on what's happening with girls worldwide, whether it's with children, adolescent girls, whether it's with women. Uh, so it's really, I welcome you to uh, this webinar to, to listen to Lauren next, um, who I'm going to hand over to shortly. Uh, and I hope that you'll be persuaded to become advocates to uh, include more of the optional modules and mix in your countries, to use data that's already there, uh, to, to put your best foot forward in countries and advocating for better and greater investments in gender policies and programs informed by mixed data. Over to you, Lauren. Thank you so much, Sadvika. 
And thanks to the data collection unit for the opportunity to present on closing gender data gaps for children and adolescents through the UNICEF supported multiple indicator cluster survey program. Um, we were having, I was having internet troubles from New York um, before. I'm going to try to keep my camera on, but may go off if, if I do lose us um, or if I lose connection. Okay, great. And I assume you can see my slides. Um, otherwise, I will have a signal that you cannot. So, um, you know, to give a roadmap or an overview of the presentation I'll be making jointly with Ava, um, you know, I want to start with defining gender statistics and gender data gaps. For some of you, this may seem very basic, but I really want to make sure that we're all on the same page in our understanding of what we mean by gender statistics and gender data gaps. Next, I'll hand it off to Ava to provide an overview of MIX, including its approach to measuring gender equality. We will then both spotlight uh, new and improved modules in the current round of MIX, MIX 7, that will contribute to closing gender data gaps, and finally, share a few resources as well as closing reflections. So, defining gender statistics. Data collection on demographic, social, and economic information, such as education and health and nutrition outcomes, combined with the collection of information on an individual's sex, their biological characteristics, whether that information comes from a census, a survey, or an administrative source, yields sex disaggregated data. But gender statistics, and this is the point I really want to, to emphasize, are more than data disaggrega disaggregated by sex. They require the application of gendered concepts, classifications, methodologies, and statistical processes in collecting the data to ensure that the data are not biased and are of high quality. So as an example, we can think of estimates of women's labor force participation. We know based on prior empirical work that they are sensitive to how survey questions are asked. And when they are not asked in a way that accounts for how women perceive employment or business ownership, they can lead to measurement error in women's labor force participation in relation to men's. As another example, measures of child labor that don't recognize the disproportionate hours girls spend on unpaid care in domestic work in comparison to boys as a form of labor underestimate girls' engagement in child labor. We also can look at gender issues that, um, you know, data that cannot be individually disaggregated but that reflect the specific status, needs, opportunities, and contributions made by women and girls. So we could think of indicators such as maternal mortality, the adolescent birth rate, female gender, uh, genital mutilation. These are all indicators that we cannot disaggregate because we either they don't apply to boys and men, or we don't have data on those on those topics. But they're also a form of gender statistics in that they're relevant to the issues we need to understand about women's and girls' well-being. And so, as a combination, this is what we mean when we say when we talk about gender statistics. So on this slide, I'm not going to read out the entire table, but I do want to stress that gender statistics require the integration of a gender perspective throughout the entire data cycle, from the assessment of gender data needs to the data dissemination and communication, as well as all stages in between. For example, if new data collection are needed, are gender specialists with subject matter expertise part of the team planning the objectives in the scope of the data collection? And you'll see as we go on throughout the presentation, um, when we present on our new modules, all of that work was informed by experts um, in gender and the given subject. So what do we mean when we talk about gender data gaps? Gender data gaps can be defined in two ways. 
First, as the absence of or limited data to derive gender statistics for developing effective policies and tracking progress towards gender equality. Drawing on Data2x's conceptual framework, these can be assessed in terms of availability. Does the indicator exist in national databases in any form? And here we, we can tell that we have an absence of data on climate and the environment and gender. Um, also, we can assess in terms of granularity. Is the indicator disaggregated by sex and other relevant characteristics? Sometimes that information is actually available. The data has been collected by sex and other key dimensions, but it hasn't been made available to the user themselves. We can also speak about gender data gaps in terms of timeliness. How often is the indicator produced to enable us to track progress towards gender equality over time. As an example, looking at time use statistics, while 90 or so countries now have at least one data point on women's time use, that number substantially decreases when we look at the number of countries that have more than one data point. And then of course, because we're focusing on uh, official statistics, do the indicators and the data and the way it's collected adhere to international standards of measurements? So in terms of uh, gender data gaps, UN Women and the UN Statistic Division released their annual gender snapshots for 2023 this uh, past year. And they noted that gender gaps remain pervasive for the nine targets and 18 indicators and sub indicators of SDG5, which is the SDG on gender equality and women's empowerment. With only 56% of the data needed to track progress on SDG5 available. At a more granular level, this heat map here presents data gaps for select indicators, SDG indicators for adolescent girls in Eastern and Southern Africa on the left and West uh, and West and Central Africa on the right. So I want to draw your attention really just to all the red and purple on the chart, with red indicating no data for a given country and purple indicating insufficient trend data to track progress towards the SDG targets. These data similarly are presented for the Middle East and North Africa on the left and South Asia on the right. Again, we see a lot of red and purple indicating no data or a lack of trend data to measure progress uh, towards gender equality for adolescent girls. And finally, uh, as uh, presenting for countries in Latin America and the Caribbean, where SDG Goal 5 data on violence against women in particular is really missing. But returning to this idea of defining gender data gaps, gender data gaps can also be defined as the statistical, lacking the statistical capacity to produce gender statistics. So while the focus of this webinar is not on the enabling environment for producing gender statistics, I want to emphasize drawing on Paris 21's framework that gender da data gaps are hindered by a weak institutional environment, including the absence of a gender focus in policy, legal, and fr financial infrastructure, a lack of political will, and limited technical capacity. And this is the, the context in which many mixed surveys are implemented. And we, when we think about closing gender data gaps, we always need to keep in mind this institutional environment. So UNICEF takes a multi-pronged approach to closing gender data gaps. These include the exploitation of different sources of gender data, including administrative records, vital registrations, population censuses, and of course the topic of today, household surveys with a focus on mix. We also develop innovative methodologies to derive new indicators to drive policy and programming results for children that are gender responsive. So in terms of measurement innovation, a few examples are the development of gender sensitive child labor indicators, the development of gender and age sensitive estimates of multidimensional child poverty, um, new work to develop a measure, measures of children's time use, as well as adolescents' mental health. 
We also make sure to cross tabulate key indicators by sex and other characteristics, including age, location, wealth, ethnicity, and thanks to the child functioning module and mix, we're able to also disaggregate by disability status of children. And of course, gen quantitative data cannot tell us everything there is to understand about women and girls' um, progress towards gender equality. So we use a combination or mixed methods on quantitative and qualitative approaches to better understand the gender-related barriers that impede successful outcomes, both for women themselves as well as children. And finally, we work to improve the dissemination and communication of gender statistics to reach diverse stakeholders, including policymakers, activists and advocates, researchers, and trying to tailor our products to each of those distinct audiences. And towards the end of the presentation, I'll give you a few examples of how we're doing that. So I'm now going to turn it over to Ava to talk, give us an overview of MIX as well as its approach to measuring gender equality. Over to you. Thank you, Lauren. Um, yes, yeah, so I think uh, for some of the participants who are very familiar with MIX, some of these slides are going to be uh, very, like you're gonna be very familiar with them, but hopefully we'll be able to provide an overview. MIX is a complex, uh, tool and, uh, you know, implementing a mix is a complex long process that we cannot discuss in detail today, but we wanted to give you at least um, um, a few uh, very key um, uh, imp key imp uh, information about the, the main features of, of mix and, and, and its process. Next. Next. Lauren, can you move to the next one? Yes, sorry, now I'm having trouble. Hold on, hold on. Ah, there we go, you got it? Yes. So um, for those of you who may not be familiar with the history of, of uh, the MIX program, um, uh, MIX, so the MIX program is a UNICEF's flagship household survey program that was developed in the early 90s. That was, this is almost 30 years ago. Um, and the initial purpose of this um, uh, program was to generate indicators or data uh, to track the indicators for the World Summit for Children, uh, first in 1995 and then in 2000. Um, with time, uh, MIX became a continuous household survey program uh, because, you know, it was increased demand by governments, um, uh, you know, to participate in the program. And this has been, uh, this program has been carried out by uh, governments, typically the national statistical offices are the implementing agencies, and in technical collaboration with, with UNICEF. Um, and over time, MIX of, uh, became has become also a major data source to track progress towards other uh, global um, uh, goals, including the Millennium Development Goals and the Sustainable Development Goals. Next. So just now uh, focusing on SDGs, um, wanted to um, also bring to your attention that um, out of the 232 SDG indicators, there are 80, only 80 of them can be sourced from household surveys. And currently MIX um, is able to cover uh, half of them, which is 40. Um, then um, moving on to this, this slide now on the key features so, yeah, of MIX, um, 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 we are currently in the seventh round of MIX, uh, which was launched last year. Um, on the right of this slide, you can see a, a bar chart that indicates the number of surveys that have been conducted in every round of MIX since MIX 1. Um, as you can see, the largest round by far uh, until now, it's been uh, MIX 6, uh, which was um, conducted between 2017 and around 2023, and with some services still um, being finalized this year. Uh, we expect uh, at least 60 um, surveys to be implemented during this uh, seventh round of mix. But maybe just going back to key features of mix surveys, uh, just for your, you know, um, for our collective reference, I wanted to mention that mix are face-to-face uh, -face interviews uh, conducted through face-to-face -face interviews. Uh, we visit households, um, so mix is based on a representative sample of households. Um, with our, while the sample size of mix surveys ranges uh, quite substantially. Um, the average sample size is 12,000 households. 
um, mix can be conducted, can be implemented and to produce, uh, uh, to be representative, sorry, can be designed to be representative at national level or subnational level. And it, it can also be designed to be representative of specific population groups. And we have examples, for example, with um, in Eastern Europe with a, uh, with a, um, um, and a series of surveys, mixed surveys that have been conducted that are uh, representative of the Roma population across uh, several countries in the in, in the region. Now, Mix produces currently uh, data on nearly 200 indicators across uh, different types of indicators, prevalence indicators, attitudinal indicators, behavioral indicators. And these are all the indicators that are compatible um, across, you know, globally, across countries. Um, and of course, all these indicators can be presented and uh, disaggregated by individual and household characteristics. Um, all mixed tools, including questionnaires, uh, um, interviewers' manuals, uh, uh, tools for like you know, tabulation plans, um, uh, syntaxes for um, analyzing the data, all, all these uh, um, tools are publicly available through the mixed website and for all countries that participate in the program. And also for each survey, we produce a statistical snapshot, survey finding reports, and anonymized microdata that is also released publicly and available both in the MIX website and in the web, on the websites of the um, uh, statistical and national uh, implementing agencies. Maybe just a uh, last point uh, to say that all surveys in MIX are currently conducted using computer-assisted uh, personal interviewing uh, or CAPI, uh, which basically means that we're capturing data uh, we, uh, using uh, electronic devices. Um, we're not using uh, uh, paper questionnaires. Mm. Uh, next, yeah. While I wanted to also maybe briefly mention that while Mix has uh, is you know a, a household survey program, over time the program has developed a, a collection of tools and uh, initiatives uh, to address various data demands and and to come up with their various data solutions. For example, we have Mix Plus. Mix Plus is one of the Mix program uh, initiatives um, that. Um, allows for the continued collection of data from a subsample of households um, via phone calls. And this allows us to do longitudinal data collection uh, over a period of a year. Um, MixLink is another initiative of the Mix program. Uh, and this is about integration of mixed data with administrative data and data from other sources. Uh, we also have uh, uh, other um, uh, tools available to new data processing tools and um, analytical tools. Uh, for example, the Mixed platform is a, a platform that allows us to do real-time um, quality assurance and monitoring of uh, mix implementation. And uh, mix tabulator, for example, is also an online analysis tool that allows us to do tabulations, uh, produce maps and graphs. And this is uh, powered by the harmonized data um, of all the mix surveys. Um, Mixed GIS finally is uh, an initiative that includes, you know, geocoding of mixed data, but also, uh, you know, integrating mixed data with your spatial covariates on climate and environment, for example, or even with, you know, other big data that can be, uh, that, that has your spatial uh, information. Next. Now, maybe, um, um, uh, so I wanted to spend a couple of minutes describing the, how the mix, uh, uh, process um, works in a country, right? Like the first, I think it is important uh, to understand the mix, uh, um, even though UNICEF uh, provides um, or, you know, collaborates with, with governments in the implementation of mix, mix is owned uh, by and led by uh, the national governments. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the implementing agency for MIX is typically the National Statistical Office, uh, the Bureau of Statistics, National Bureau of Statistics. Um, so in UNICEF is not the implementing agency of, 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 of MIX. Um, countries join the MIX program based on demand. Um, and, and, and actually, um, uh, in an increasing number of countries, what we are seeing seeing is that MIX has become part of the long-term statistical plans of these countries. And in in in, in increasing number of countries, uh, it's being funded entirely or primarily by governments. 
what the starting point usually for uh, to make a decision about whether uh, you know a country is going to participate in a uh, or, in, or you know in the mix program uh, is a data gap assessment. Um, you know, uh, different is, is a, this is based on uh, or informed by a discussion amongst government stakeholders, including Ministry of Planning, line ministries like Education, Health Ministries, um, UNICEF and UNA agencies, but also other national stakeholders. Um, so there's a process where this there's a, an assessment of data gaps there's a perceived you know um, um you know lack of data in in certain programmatic areas that may be a priority for the country and this is actually assessed vis-a-vis -vis what you know the indicators that mix uh, can produce and that the decision is made um whether you know you know it's it's important for the country to participate in the in the program now once that decision is made um there's a process by which uh the implementing agencies are going to be signing up and, and UNICEF are going to be signing a memorandum of understanding and following this, um, you know, steering and technical committees for this survey are going to be established and the process uh, uh, for preparing, designing and implementing the survey will start. Um, there is maybe you can move to the next slide, please. Then the I mentioned earlier that mix, uh, sorry, UNICEF collaborates uh, with uh, um, governments in the implementation of, of MIX. And here we have a very detailed um, um, in, uh, technical collaboration framework that um, basically covers and establishes roles and responsibilities from beginning from the beginning of the survey process until the end. And here what you see are the main, um, you know, um, institutions or you know teams that are involved in the technical collaboration framework. On the one hand, you have the National Statistical Office as the typical implementing agency for MIX. The student committee and the technical committees are formed by uh, both uh, members of the National Statistical Office, the department that is maybe coordinating the MIX, but also in, in, include um, representatives of different like ministries and other government agencies that are uh, that have an in, a, a vested interest in, in, in the MIX. Um, National Statistical Office will collaborate with the UNICEF country office um, and there's uh, we typically have a national mix consultant who is uh, a person that is recruited for the purpose of uh, ensuring the liaison between the UNICEF country office and the implementing agencies. And then we do have uh, the global mix team, uh, which is com it's uh, it's formed by a combination of experts at at HQ level, at the headquarters level of in, in UNICEF, at the regional office level, and also you know includes both uh, staff members of UNICEF and uh, expert consultants uh, who specialize in the areas of household survey design, questionnaire design and implementation, sampling, or and data processing, and the collaboration. Uh, um, among all of these um, different teams is, you know, it's continuous uh, from beginning to end of the process and of the mixed survey process. And it, it combines both uh, off-site technical collaboration and also on-site, meaning there are like uh, times where all these experts are deployed in, in, in country uh, as needed to, you know, work more closely and more effectively if needed with the national uh, implementing agencies. Next. Okay, so now moving on uh, to to basically share uh, what we think mix or why mix is unique uh, in in um, in a way uh, in in allowing for or being a, a strong uh, tool for measuring gender equality. Um, there are a few points I think are important to uh, emphasize here. First, mix collects data from birth to adulthood, which means that we you know, we collect information about household members from, you know, you know, infants. And even before that, we're, we're um, you know, asking um, women about their pregnancies and um, and their deliveries of babies, etc. So we do collect information from the fairly early stages of life until adulthood. Um, that allows us, you know, this is a life course approach that allows us to collect data uh, across different age groups. Um, Mix collects gender data with disaggregation by multiple characteristics, and and um, Lauren has already spoken a little bit about that. What this does is it enables um, intersectional analysis. Um, 
when you do simultaneous uh, disaggregation of data by sex and other characteristics like age or educational attainment, um, wealth, household wealth, or disability status, for example, this allows um, us to identify the most marginalized girls and women. So basically, what internet, what the the reason why intersectional analysis is important is because it recognizes that girls are not a homogeneous group, right? So just disaggregating by sex doesn't give us a full picture of the different risks and opportunities that different, you know, individual girls and women uh, may face based on on their background characteristics. Now, another important element uh, that makes you makes a unique uh, uh, tool for measuring gender equality is that uh, we interview um, all household members between ages of 15 and 49, which means that um, rather than uh, relying on um, proxy respondents to collect information about all household members, we do uh, collect information directly from um, from uh, both males and females, and, and these also allows us for intra-household analysis of inequalities and differences between you know, household members or among household members. Now, MIX also collects uh, countries that participate in the MIX program, uh, typically participate in, in all times over over the years. So um, some countries are participating in us in cycles of four or five years in every mixed round. Uh, but what that that what that uh, means is that um, this there's a periodic collection of of data that enables us to assess gender equality and uh, women's and girls empowerment over time. And um, also a final point that I wanted to uh, emphasize is that we're collecting data uh, directly uh, from uh, adolescent girls between currently between ages and, uh, 15 and 19, but we're also looking uh, at collecting um, self, you know, data directly from adolescent girls, younger adolescent girls uh, in the future. Um, so next. Now, just coming back to this idea of the life, life course approach, um, uh, here I wanted to just provide a little more details about this. So the mix uh, questionnaires is, um, you know, basically is, is a, a set of like five questionnaires that each of which collects data at a different level. So um, there's one questionnaire, the household questionnaire that collects information that is um, um, at the household level, right? So household characteristics and access to, um, water, access to sanitation, access to electricity, um, use of malaria, um, bed nets uh, against malaria. So things that are can are measure or best measure are, are, are household level. Then we have a number of in, individual level uh, or questionnaires that collect data at individual level. The first one is the um, under five questionnaire, which collects data for children uh, um, below age five. We do have an, a questionnaire that then collects information about children and adolescents uh, between ages five and 17. And then we have the individual uh, women uh, and men questionnaires that collect information uh, for or interview directly um, household members between ages and of 15 and 49. So as you can see now, um, the questionnaire on, for children under five allows us to look at, focus on indicators that are very relevant for early childhood. At this point, gender disparities are often small, but as we move into adolescence um, and with the onset of puberty and the beginning of the consolidation of gender norms, we can start seeing like uh, how some of the gender disparities are become uh, more pronounced. And then in adulthood, uh, now gender disparities are like sort of like consolidated and and are impacting the well-being of women as well as the well impact of their well-being the their, the well-being of their children um here i wanted to highlight that questionnaire for children and adolescents uh, uh, between the ages of five and 17 this questionnaire was introduced in mix in the sixth round of mix and as has allowed us to you know help provide and generate more data to close the key data gaps, especially on the younger adolescents uh, between 10 and, and 13, which is a period when gender disparities begin to emerge, but is also a, an age group for which data are, are often scarce. Next. So I think 
Lauren, I'm going to back, hand over to you now. Back yeah. to me. And if you don't mind, I'm going to keep my uh, camera off because I keep getting indications that I have an unstable internet connection. So thank you, Ava. Um, I'm going to share a few examples now of the gender analysis we are able to undertake um, using mixed data due to mixed measurements approaches to gender equality that Ava just discussed. So presenting a life course approach, this chart shows average minutes spent per day collecting water based on mixed data by sex as well as age, including boys and girls under 10, adolescents 10 to 19, and adults 20 and over. And it shows that gender differences in the time adolescents spend collecting water begin to really emerge in adolescence. So among the younger children, we see very few differences. We start to see differences among adolescents. And then as they transition into adulthood, this disparity intensifies with women bearing the brunt of water collection in most countries with data. And moreover, while the gender data gaps among adolescents are relatively smaller compared to the adult cohort, it's important to be reminded that even small differences disadvantaging girls can socialize them into thinking that domestic duties are women's and girls' responsibilities, jeopardizing the continuity of their education and movement into the labor market. So we, we do know now that there's a lot of emphasis on time use data as one of the goal five SDG indicators, five, uh, four, one. And most of that attention is focused on disparities in uh, burdens of unpaid domestic and care work among adults. But using mixed data in this case, as well as other data um, on the time children spend on unpaid domestic and care work, we can make the argument and advocate to pay attention to these disparities in childhood. Because as Ava noted before, we see in adolescence that these are when these gender norms consolidate and we see girls moving and taking on more of this burden and it's really limiting their transition into the labor force. So here is an example um, of a preliminary analysis highlighting intersectionality. In this case, um, our colleagues are undertaking intersectional analysis to disaggregate multidimensional child poverty estimates, not only by sex and in this case, rural urban location, but by other key characteristics as well. And the reason this is important is because we know that gender disparities intersect with other aspects of identity, such as age, race, ethnicity, and socioeconomic status. And if we fail to disaggregate by sex and these other key characteristics, we may fail to identify the most marginalized population and tell our interventions accordingly. So again, this is a preliminary analysis based on one country, Iraq, but it's showing that boys living in urban areas, the light blue uh, bars you see here, are less likely to experience multidimensional poverty or to suffer from two or more deprivations than girls residing in rural areas in Iraq, which are represented by the darker blue bars. Again, um, we'll be doing this for the entirety of the global database on multidimensional poverty to really begin to try to unpack and identify whether gender differences exist when we intersect sex with other key characteristics. Um, because we know that when we look at the national aggregates for multidimensional poverty, we tend not to see many differences between boys and girls, but applying an intersectional analysis allows us to dig deeper, of course. So as another um, example of intersectional analysis, this chart presents trends in child marriage since 1997 nationally, which you see as the gray bars or the gray lines for all young women, as well as for young women living in the richest and poorest households with the poorest represented by the blue lines and the richest by the orange. And it shows that across all regions, progress in ending child marriage has largely benefited girls from the richest households. So if we were to only focus on national aggregates, we would fail to identify that decreases in child marriage are not being observed among girls from the poorest households and in some regions are actually increasing among girls in the poorest households. 
The next example I wanted to highlight um, is an example of the intra-household analysis we can do from mixed data, because as Ava noted, all adolescent girls and women age 15 to 49, as well as adolescent boys age 15 to 49, when the men's questionnaire is implemented in a given country, are interviewed. So interviewing all of these household members allows us to unpack the household to consider how resources may be differently allocated based on gender or other individual characteristics such as age, um, marital status, etc. This chart presents an intra-household analysis of youth's mobile phone ownership using mixed data showing that across 41 countries for which data were available and territories, female youth are nearly 13% less likely to own a mobile phone than male youth within the same household, limiting their ability to participate in the digital world. So gender gaps and access to phone ownership exist not only across households, but within households, challenging the notion of the household as a unitary model in which resources are distributed equally. I'm now going to turn back to Ava to spotlight some of the gender indicators that can be derived from MIX-7, as well as a few of the new modules um, that have been introduced in the current round. Thank you, Lauren. Can you move? Yes. So here is a list of select indicators uh, that can be produced with mixed data that are relevant for adolescent girls. And we have a group them by age group uh, so that, you know, we can start like having getting a sense of the scope and, you know, the breadth of the types of indicators that are relevant for these two, um, you know, age groups. Um, um, so the panel on the left is for young adolescent girls uh, between ages 10 and 14, and the panel on the right uh, focuses on list of indicators that are relevant for adolescent girls um, between the age uh, or older adolescents between 15 and 19 years of age. Um, some of these uh, indicators are SDG indicators, and this is uh, indicated in, you know, in the column next to the indicator. But um, so in, you come, you know, in total, uh, there there is, you know, mixes covering 21 sex disaggregated or gender specific SDG indicators. Um, currently, mix is also um, covering uh, offering the broadest coverage of education indicators included in the UN minimum set of gender indicators. And of course, there are a number of other thematically relevant measures that are not captured in the SDG framework or other frameworks. Um, but this is just, um, this is um, an, an, an list that is not necessarily exhaustive and the, the full list of mixed indicators is available on, on the MIX website. Next. So now we're now going to highlight uh, a few topics that are um, new in uh, in mix in the mix seven uh, round. Um, the first one is the violence against women and other. No, violence against women and adolescent girls is a manifestation of gender equality, um, but we do not have consistent or comparable data um, uh, across countries, um, or we do have limited data that is available currently. So we we within by um, collecting this data now in mix, uh, we expect to or we hope to also expand the data coverage uh, for key prevalence indicators of, of violence. And um, the key two indicators that are, can be generated with this uh, um, with this module in mix are SDG indicator 521 uh, on intimate partner violence and indicate SDG indicator 522 on non-partner sexual violence. Um, there are other indicators that have to do with access or, you know, um, uh, career seeking and, you know, um, other uh, related indicators too, but these are the two main uh, prevalent indicators that can be generated with this module. Now, um, this module is based on the domestic violence module that was developed by the Demographic Health Surveys 
the DHS program. Um, it's, it has been used also widely uh, uh, among countries participating in the DHS program. Um, it's um, it's administered to one adolescent girl or woman age 15 to 49 in every household. And we only do this, we only administer this module to one woman in, or girl in every household due to the sensitivity of the topic. We don't, we want to make sure that nobody else in the household is aware that these questions are being asked. Um, and this is for the safety and protection of the respondent. We do have very um, clear and um, you know strong ethical and referral protocols in place for the implementation of this module. Um, UNICEF is currently working on a set of questions to measure sexual violence in childhood. So I want to emphasize that you know this again. This module is um, is is good, and we consider this is a, a solid module for collecting data uh, for you know between ages of fifteen and forty nine. Um, for estimating uh, violence, sexual violence in childhood, um, UNICEF considers that we need to do some, you know, that we need a different set of questions. And as as um, as the methodological work progresses and is finalized, we'll be able to include and offer those questions also in, in mix. Next. Another I think another topic that is new in the mix seven is the HPV or human papilloma virus. Uh, topic uh this uh this topic um is related to sdg indicator 3.b.1 which is the percentage of 15 year old girls who receive two doses of hp of the hpv vaccine um this uh, hpv prevention is a unicef health program priority for adolescent girls and this is uh, reflected in the adolescent uh, girl program strategy um uh, for this uh, current cycle uh, 2020 to 2025 um, and the reason is because nearly 10% of all female cancer deaths are linked to HPV. Um, again, you know, there's some limited data on HPV uh, status, uh, vaccination status, and so the inclusion of, mo uh, of the module in MIX-7 uh, is expected to expand data coverage and, and help us progress, um, track progress over time. Back to you, Lauren. Thank you. So um, I'm going to spotlight uh, a couple of additional modules. Um, the first is a, a module that is newly integrated into MIX-7 on reproductive agency. We know that women's and adolescent girls' autonomy to make decisions about their sexual and reproductive health is key to their empowerment and ability to chart their own life course but data are limited. As you see in this chart, we have aggregate data available for only three UNICEF program regions, and the picture is, is quite worrisome. Here we're presenting data on the percentage of adolescent girls age 15 to 19, married or in union, who are able to make their own decisions regarding sexual relations, contraceptive use, and reproductive health care. This is SDG indicator 5.6.1. And we see that in West and Central Africa, only one in 10 married or partnered adolescent girls in this age group are able to make these decisions about their sexual and reproductive health. Just a quarter in South Asia and less than one in two in the other region presented here. So the inclusion of this module and mix will increase data coverage, allowing more countries to report on the SDG indicator, but more importantly, to track their progress towards women's and girls increased reproductive agency. So I wanted to give an example in addition to uh, modules that are newly introduced to mix, uh, two examples of improvements we made to modules that were already in the last round of mix, mix six. Um, here we have um, a, a social transfer module that was included in mix six and uh, the standard questions in that module are guided by UNICEF's social protection strategic framework. They primarily cover social transfers and social protection interventions that enhance access to services such as health and education. So we haven't we haven't changed um, that formulation of the questions, but in mix six, the questions were asked at the household level. For example, does anyone in your household receive a social transfer? In mix seven, we are now asking those questions at the individual level. 
such as who in the household is the transfer intended for and who in the household is authorized to receive this transfer. So collecting this data at the individual level, we will have the sex of, of that individual, we will have the age of that individual, as well, as well as other key characteristics of that individual, which really opens up a window of opportunity for gender analyses of whether social transfer programs are reaching women and girls, and to what extent women are authorized to receive the benefits they may be intended that may be intended for them or for their children. And this really contributes to a growing demand for sex disaggregated data on social protection because better sex disaggregated data can help us highlight gender gaps in social protection coverage and adequacy and help make the case for the expansion and potentially reallocation of resources to expand access in an inclusive manner. Better data can also assess and enhance the impacts of policies and programs on women and girls, as well as gender equality, poverty, and resilience outcomes more broadly. And so we've been jointly um, working on the re we worked jointly on the revision of these questions with our colleagues um, in social policy and the program group of UNICEF and are also engaging um, across agencies, in particular with the World Bank and the Social Protection Interagency Cooperation Board Gender Working Group, the SPIAC-B <laughs> as, a, as, a, uh, as an acronym. I wanted to give another example of improvements we made um, to an existing module for MIX-6 on menstrual health and hygiene. We know that the ability of adolescent girls and women to manage their monthly menstrual cycle in privacy and with dignity is fundamental to their health, psychosocial well-being, and their mobility. Uh, MIX-6 introduced a module um, on menstrual hygiene with questions on washing and changing in privacy, materials used, and exclusion from social activities during menstruation. Improvements have been made to the uh, set of questions in MIX-7 informed by groups of experts. So again, linking back to that idea of um, when we're designing new data collections, are we integrating a, a gender perspective in the data cycle by making sure that subject matter experts and gender experts are involved in those decision-making processes and the planning of the new data collection? The new questions focus on a private place to change materials, uh, whether materials were sufficient to meet women and girls' needs, we ask now separately about different uh, exclusion from different activities, such as schooling, education, et cetera. We ask whether materials were sufficient. Um, awareness, we also ask about awareness about menstruation before the first period, comfort seeking help from healthcare providers, and the ability to manage menstrual pain. And so, this does not, you know, this is not an SDG indicator, um, but we do know that, um, you know, this is important thematically to goal six on, on WASH. And there's been work done um, by our colleagues within UNICEF, um, as well as the WHO and partners from academia, civil society, to really think about how can we better gender um, the WASH indicators and really reflect on the needs of adolescent girls and women in relation to access to basic services across um, water, sanitation, and sp specifically here, menstrual health and hygiene. So this is contributing to a key gender data gap by now improving these questions in MIX-7. So I wanted to turn now, um, you know, just really to a few examples of the available resources uh, before concluding with some final reflections. As I said earlier, um, you know, thinking through integrating a gender perspective in the data cycle entails thinking about how do we disseminate the gender data and statistics that we do collect and analyze. And here's an ex um, example of a mixed product, the, the mixed statistical snapshot, this one specifically on gender equality, though it's one in a series of mixed snapshots. It was introduced in mix six um, and really to develop, uh, develop to guide countries in the analysis of gender inequalities, again, using this life cycle approach where we focus 
focus on um, early childhood, adolescence, and then adulthood. So using that approach, we present key indicators and corresponding messages on gender equality across the life course on surviving and thriving, learning, protection from violence and exploitation, living in a safe and clean environment, and having an equitable chance in life. And these snapshots are produced by the country alongside the survey finding reports and are meant to be a more concise summary um, you know, to share with policymakers and other key stakeholders so they can have the thematic data at their fingertips. I also wanted to introduce um, the uh, relatively new adolescent girl country profiles that we developed in UNICEF along with our colleagues in the gender program section. Um, the purpose of these profiles is really to be used as an advocacy and analytic tool, providing the evidence base for policy and program design in support of adolescent girls. We see the intended users as UNICEF staff and partners, including adolescent girls themselves. And I've talked to adolescent girls who have advised on the usability and the interface of these profiles. And so we were really working across the assumption that while many of UNICEF's data products feature sex disaggregated and gender specific indicators, these data are often presented by sector since we know gender statistics are, you know, span across various sectors rather than under the thematic lens of gender equality. And we wanted to bring these data together alongside additional indicators central for man monitoring adolescent girls' well-being. And so while the profiles include indicators that are not available through MIX, a large proportion of the indicators are indeed sourced through MIX. Um, and we, you know, just briefly, we talked about when we, we were thinking and starting on this project, we were thinking about what are the, how do we prioritize indicators? So are they relevant? Do they align with UNICEF's adolescent girl program strategy and the theory of change articulated in that strategy? Are they included in existing key indicator frameworks such as UNICEF's um, strategic plan and corresponding gender action plan, the SDG indicator framework, and the UN minimum set of gender indicators. So of course, also we wanted to adhere to the spirit of parsimony in the sense that we're presenting a select set of indicators needed to capture adolescent girls' well-being because we wanted the user to be able to download these profiles in a maximum of three pages. Oops. So very briefly, I'm won't go through all of these, but here is a list, um, and you, I believe the PowerPoint will be shared afterwards. So here is a list with links to um, additional gender data resources available through UNICEF. The first is, of course, the UNICEF MIX homepage, which will link you to the, the different survey tools, the questionnaires, as well as detailed um, guidance on the different modules that Ava and I have been reviewing with you. We also um, have, a, you know, uh, keep and compile key sex disaggregated and gender specific indicators across a range of sectors in our UNICEF global databases that are easily accessible. We have a UNICEF gender equality data landing page, um, as well as a UNICEF adolescent data portal, which is where you're, you'll find the adolescent girl country profiles I just mentioned, as well as a UNICEF gender statistics strategy, um, which really lays out in much more detail a lot of what we've been presenting here. So lastly, maybe a, a final reflection that Ava and I were thinking about um, and, and, you know, and how to summarize and, and end this. Um, you know, I hope you've seen throughout the course of this presentation that MIX is a powerful instrument in the toolbox towards closing gender data gaps for children and women. We really feel that stakeholders, including those of you here on the call with us, have an important role to play in advocating for country implementation of MIX, as well as the inclusion of these gender modules based on country priorities. So making sure we're at the table when these data gap assessments are being done, that the priorities of civil society, including women's and adolescent girls groups are represented so that we can ensure that the modules they care about will be be implemented in the data collected in the MIX uh, survey. 
But of course, closing gender data gaps requires consideration of the larger data ecosystem. So looking, linking back to that second definition I presented of data gaps, thinking about weak institutional environments and how to strengthen them. It includes the coordination across multiple sectors and data sources, because again, gender statistics span so many sectors, there's some particular challenges to strengthening and closing gender data caps. We have to you know, devote more budget, resources, of course, making sure that the items that are cared about are reflected in the policy and have corresponding indicators for measurements. And we also need to think about the demands of data users and other producers outside of the realm of official statistics to help us close some of these key gender data gaps. Of course, this is not an easy task and we could really have a whole entire another presentation on the enabling environment for gender data but we do believe it's a crucial task. So thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, Eva and Lauren. I'm trying to switch on my camera. I hope it's working. Yeah, it should work now. Thank you so much for, for this great presentation and uh, from my side and also from, from our participant side, we are receiving messages. Uh, I really find very, very useful to actually remind ourselves that we, when we are talking about gender data and gender data gaps, it's not just enough to have disaggregated data by sex. I think this is something that really needs to be emphasized uh, more than once, because sometimes we all think, okay, we have disaggregation uh, by sex, it's, uh, it's done, we have the data. Uh, uh, we are receiving, we started receiving questions. Uh, I want to start uh, with first one, actually. It's saying, uh, do you calculate the right to receive care according to gender in a family? So let me stop there and then I will group the rest of the questions and, and uh, uh, read it to you. Um, Ava, do you want me to take the first shot at that? I mean, I think simply put, we would all household members are entitled to care, um, you know, independent of their of their sex or gender. Um, you know, well, and then in terms of some of the data that Mix collects, we do uh, we we collect data on the time. Um, that children five to 17 um, spend caring for other household members. So that could be for other children, younger children, for example, um, maybe other sick um, or dependent household family members. Um, and we do again see uh, pretty large gender gaps on average between the time spent. Um, we also collect data um, on um, pa parental stimulation with younger children. So uh, parents interaction with younger children are able to analyze um, if we see differences, both in the time that parents or other can caregivers spend, as well as different interactions um, based on the sex of the child. But I think from a normative perspective, um, you know, UNICEF believes everybody, of course, has, has a right to care, but would like to alleviate some of the disproportionate burdens of care work placed um, placed on girls. I don't know, Ava, if you wanted to come in on that. I think you just uh, addressed the question very well, so nothing to add from my side. Thank you so much, Lauren. Okay, I have next two questions, which are actually uh, uh, related to, to mixed implementation. It's uh, about, uh, yeah, mixed findings support many humanitarian act actors in the field. How do you ensure that all family members are interviewed in contrast to most other surveys where one household member is interviewed as a proxy for all? where females respondents may not be adequately represented. How challenging is this? And uh, maybe in the same uh, uh, area, if I can say, uh, as you have highlighted a gap in the data for very young adolescent, are you considering including a reproductive calendar beyond two years before the survey? Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so let me just address the first question. Um, so the way it mixes design I mentioned, we have different questionnaires. So um, we have a questionnaire that collects data at, um, that is relevant at household level. And those questions are administered to um, a knowledgeable adult uh, member of the household. Um, and then we do have four individual questionnaires that collect uh, individual level data uh, for children under five, for children between ages of five and 17, and then for, you know, you know females and males between the ages of 15 and 49. So usually, um, you know, when we are uh, um, in at this sample design stage, um, you know, we select households and um, we conduct, um, once we have our sample of households selected, um, then, uh, you know, as part of the mixed process, um, household listing exercises conducted, and so we identify, you know, the household members in and list the household members in in the selected households. So now, when you are going to visit the household, you know uh, how many eligible members in the household you have for each of the these questionnaires, right? So for household, for the household questionnaire, you are going to be interviewing, as I said, somebody who is an adult uh, member of the household, ideally the head of the household, but it could be an, an adult who can answer these general questions about the household, uh, because in the household questionnaire, we we have very few questions about um, about. Uh, um, you know, individual level data, uh, this is okay, right? We don't, uh, as long as the person who is responding is knowledgeable of, you know, you know, has information, you know, is knowledgeable about this information at household level, then it's okay. Now, when we go to the individual level, uh, we have to actually find the person, right? The, 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 the household member that is eligible for that particular mm -hmm. uh, interview. So for example, let's say now in the household, you have a 15 year old uh, girl and a 30 year old woman, 30 year old woman and a you know, 49 year old woman. So we would be administering the individual household, uh, sorry, the individual female questionnaire uh, to each of them. What are the challenges related to these? Well, so that in larger households, obviously we have to uh, conduct more interviews. So we have to spend more time in the household. And also because we we have to, um, our protocols and build in, uh, sample implementation protocols um, in, uh, indicate that you have to, interviewers have to uh, at least attempt three times, right? To find the respondent. That means that, you know, uh, there's a consider considerable effort to find the respondents if they are not there uh, the, the first time, uh, the first visit of the household. So for example, let's say, you know, a team arrives in a household, they interview the the, the head of the household or some adult uh, knowledgeable member um, for the household questionnaire then, and then they, they, they have three more interviews to conduct, but not all of the eligible uh, respondents are available at the time so these then the interviewers the interviewer will have to uh, schedule uh, a time to come back uh, when the the respondents are available but in general we do have uh, really you know high response rates across all these uh, the questionnaires individual questionnaires included uh, we do face some more challenges uh, you know um, in terms of um, um, finding uh, or being able to interview uh, certain uh, members of house the household in say for example rural set uh, sorry urban settings versus rural settings and urban settings say especially males are some Sometimes harder to 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 interview or to find, uh, you know, after repeated visits. But still, you know, we are um, our response rates are are very high across the board. Of course, it also varies across regions and you know, meaning across countries and also within within uh, um, countries itself. But um, in general, um, yes, we are. Yeah, we're able to interview different members of the household. Um, now. About the second question, uh, so I, I think I'm, I'm not sure I understand fully the question. I, I, I don't know if this question is, is, if this question is referring to the, the reproductive calendar uh, in the DHS. Um, yeah, so what we do have is, um, I think we, in, in mix, we collect a sample size that is sufficient uh, for, you know, with just looking at two years and we don't need um, really detailed information on contraceptive failure or um, or continuation rates in, in, in such details. So actually we did some uh, methodological work uh, on um, 
on this two-year reference period for, uh, versus five years and found that uh, mm -hmm. first we, th there was no much uh, um, sacrifice in sampling errors from going from five years to two years. And we were also getting more recent data, right? Just focusing on the second years. And so basically minimizing uh, issues with recall or, you know, bias or memory or, you know, uh, ability to, pro pro to, to provide accurate data uh, for a longer period of time. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, thanks, Eva. Thank you very much. Uh... Now, when, when you were talking, it just reminded me on, on one question that we are asking very often. Uh, it's basically with all these new, uh, new topics that we are having now in mix seven, uh, is there anything from gender perspective that is missing from mix, how it can be further, uh, further strengthened and what we are doing because you were explaining we have uh, individual questionnaire for uh, for uh, uh, women and men uh, how we are dealing when there is no questionnaire for men you know is there this a big issue how we can uh, what we can do about it Lauren do you want to come in on this Right. Sure. I mean, I, mean I, I, I won't say just let's keep adding modules to mix. I mean, of course, people working <laughs> on gender data, um, you know, with, the, with that have an understanding of the gender data gaps we face across different domains will always want more data. Um, but, you know, we have to consider the trade-offs for the larger survey. And um, as my mixed colleagues could, could describe better than me, it's a lengthy survey with many moving pieces, water quality assessments, et cetera. And we really um, want to be careful not to overburden um, the survey itself because then we wind up um, decreasing data quality, et cetera. So, I mean, I think there's, as we've been, as we presented, there's, you know, mix seven is um, sort of a, a qualitatively improved um, survey and in, in terms of the gender data that will be yielded um, you know we are engaging in in other methodological work um, to measure you know for new measures at the population level such as gender norms related to this issue of the disproportionate burden of of unpaid um, chore work on children, adolescent empowerment, um, you know, whether those make it in, into mix and maybe a streamlined version remains to be seen based on, again, um, the policy and programmatic needs of, of the countries. But we will, um, in any case, have those tools available um, if and when finalized as publicly available goods, but also recognizing that, um, you know, household surveys are not the only source of data. I saw a quick, uh, when I did a quick skim of the chat, I saw a question around um, administrative data. And yeah. indeed, we do, um, you know, we, we did a, a set of guidance for countries um, um, in partnership with the interagency and expert group on gender statistics to strengthen administrative data systems to help close some of these gender data gaps. You know, in some countries, those administrative data systems are much more nascent. In, in other countries where you have much more advanced administrative data system, a lot of these key indicators are coming um, from those administrative data sources. But I think, you know, we need a multi-pronged effort and greater interoperability between those data sources. I don't think we're we're going to replace uh, household surveys, nor should we. Um, some of the key information, particularly around, around attitudes, some behavioral indicators, et cetera, are really, um, you know, sourced from household surveys. And at least from a gender perspective, that's quite important for us to still have um, back to you. Tatiana. Yeah, thank you, Lauren. Actually, I wanted to emphasize this question that you, you mentioned. Uh, it's about yeah, what we can use from administrative data and then survey data. Are those actually replaceable in both direction? But yeah, I think you, you, you already answered that. Uh, so maybe, Tatiana, yeah, maybe if, yeah, if I may please go ask, ahead. Um... Because you also asked the question about is, what are the challenges when, for example, we don't include the men's questionnaire in mix, yeah. and now we're only collecting information, right? Obviously, now um, one risk that we may obviously we won't be able to to segregate by sex some of the indicators that are common uh, across these in uh, questionnaires, but 
um, one a risk that I think sometimes is overlooked is that when you only collect data on um, on females, then there are certain issues that you are uh, sort of making them sort of female specific when they are actually not right. So, for example, we have um, um, in this mix uh, in the last mix, round of mix, we have uh, roll out um, a module on that measures. Um, depression and anxiety and suicidality among young people between the ages of 15 and 24. Now, if you are only collecting data uh, measuring, you know, these mental health um, conditions among women or young, you know, adolescents and young women, uh, and you're not collecting this data on on young adolescent men and, and, and boys and men, that obviously what, what we are having, what we're doing here is a disservice to First of all, we are sort of like identifying or like we're sending the message that this seems to be like a is only like a female issue um, and sort of like contributing to sort of like the stigmatization of like, you know, uh, mental health and, you know, females. But also we're we're mm -hmm. not giving mm -hmm. visibility to this, this uh, the, the, an issue that is also a problem is an important problem among uh, the, the male population. So one of the things that we, we advise against, right, for some of these very uh, specific or uh, sensitive modules, we advised against collecting information at all if you're not going to collect information both on uh, females and males. Yeah. Yeah, thanks very much, Eva. I think that was important to emphasize. Okay, there is a question uh, uh, saying, could you speak to the data gaps associated with the rising identification as non-binary? So probably, yeah, this is I something yeah, that. <laughs> that it would be good to, to clarify. Yeah, yeah, no, yes, thank you. And I knew that question would arise. Um, we've spent a lot of time thinking about this. Um, you know, I, I think the short answer is we don't have, um, there's no international standards on how to measure gender identity yet. And here I'm distinguishing gender identity from, um, you know, biological sex or sometimes described as sex assigned at birth. Some, you know, there have been individual countries that are making much methodological progress in this area, including, for example, the US, New Zealand, Canada. Um, and there are some countries that have been including non binary or, or, you know, sort of third spirit, et cetera, these non binary categories on gender identity in their data collections, including their census, such as Nepal, for example. Um, but we don't have international standards yet. Um, and moreover, you know, in a and using the sample typical or average sample sizes of a mix, given the low prevalence of these of these subpopulations of persons, um, we're not going to be able to capture in a in a statistical way that we could then represent the data on those groups. Um, so you know, there's a there's an argument to be made, and and Finland has adopted this perspective where um, you, you know they still ask the questions about non-binary identity um, because you know from a human rights perspective, persons filling out the 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 questionnaire should be allowed to see themselves in the data and want to see themselves in the data. So if they don't identify as male or female, um, they want those other options because of again those issues of small sample sizes. Um, you know, different countries have to then regroup those um, those respondents to the male female binary. But um, you know, some people. I mean, people will argue it's important to see. I think from a mixed perspective, and Ava could potentially elaborate more. We have to keep in mind that these are country-owned um, surveys, and in, in many countries, these are not only sensitive, but but you know, topics that would result in illegality. Um, in uh, you know really um, put the respondent safety at risk. And so these are, it, we very much recognize that UNICEF, this is an important area and, and another axis of discrimination for um, people that identify as uh, non-binary or other gender identities such as trans, for example. But I don't think from a measurement perspective, um, we're quite there yet. Um, especially in the context of mix, um, although in other data collection platforms such as um, the UNICEF U report, which is sort of an online polling platform um, of youth, we do um, capture non-binary identity there. But again, um, these are not representative samples, but again, the, the proportion of people responding as such are so small that we're not able to present um, those results in a meaningful way over. 
Thank you very much, Lauren, for that. Uh, I don't see any questions. I think we covered everything. Some of them I didn't uh, directly ask because they were covered when you answered uh, 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 before that. Uh, please, Eva. Yeah, I think there's I, one about the sustainability of mix. Maybe yeah, actually, just... yeah, yeah. This was when uh, just uh, yeah. Please say a few words because Lauren was uh, was covering these, trying to explain what is the difference between uh, uh, survey and administrative data. But yeah, please go ahead. It's important yeah, topic. I, I think I think no. I mean, I think there's another aspect of sustainability that I wanted to mention. I think all these survey uh, or these sorry, like you know, as we've talk about or consider a data ecosystem, we see different sources of data, you know, um, mm -hmm. sort of like addressing different needs and and they not, as we've discussed earlier, right? Not necessarily like replaceable or, you know, but I do believe that it's important to uh, reduce or minimize redundancies. So I think this is something that in country discussions we, we encourage when we do, you know, when we're in the process of discussing a mix, we encourage uh, our, our counterparts and uh, you know government stakeholders to consider really, uh, you know, what topics are really needed and are best suited for um, you know data collection in 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 a household survey like mix, right? So, avoiding duplications, reducing duplications, also. You know, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, looking at the potential integration, right, of mixed data with ad existing administrative sources. That also, this is to you. We we all like. I think we're all in concern about you know how costly some of these exercises may be. How sometimes some of the investments uh, in in different data collection or data generation efforts are you know are not very efficient. So we do definitely want to encourage um, always you know. Uh, thorough assessment of data sources, existing data sources, what are the best, you know, tools to, you know, collect certain data, uh, you know, strengthening administrative um, systems in some countries is going to take a very long time. Unfortunately, household service might be the only option available at the time. And so, you know, better to have some data from household service than not, no, no data just because administrative records cannot collect that. But also, again, uh, there is data that uh, cannot be collected in, in, you know, through an administrative system, right? That um, that can collect be collected in, in in household surveys. So, for example, now when we're trying to looking at integration of household mixed data with data from the education information management information system, we're, what we're seeing is that we can now bring together. Um, um, information about the child, the household in which the, a child um, lives, environment, maybe the parental parental support to um, you know their education, and on the other hand, we can then uh, bring uh, information from the education information system, the administrative system, uh, on the school infrastructure and some like overall quality of a school, you know, maybe uh, pupil to teacher ratios and, and other indicators that provide us uh, an, an idea of the quality of education. And now, when you bring all this together and you're looking, for example, at learning outcomes, uh, which are measured also in mix, uh, then you can see, you know, maybe you, you can do a more um, uh, uh, like kind of like uh, in-depth analysis of what are the factors, the main drivers, right, behind, you know, maybe uh, learning outcomes. Is it, you know, how much weight, right, household um, level factors versus a school level factors, you know, have in, in those, you know, in those outcomes. So just, yeah to just think, yeah, I wanted to sort of emphasize and bring back, you know, some of the discussions we had earlier or we mentioned earlier about integration and, and how this, you know, could help also um, with the efficiencies in the, you know, in, 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 in the system, in the global ecosystem in a country. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eva. And thank you again, Lauren. Uh, if there is nothing else from your side, I would, give a word to Archana to close this. Thank you so much, everyone who participated. It was really insightful and great webinar. So see you soon. Thank you so much, uh, Lauren, Ava, um, and Satvika for this excellent presentation and giving the overview, and also for Tatiana for chairing. Um, I'd like to thank also all of you for participating and for the great questions and comments. 
Uh, and we hope that you enjoyed today's webinar and the 2024 webinar series. We'll be taking a break over the summer and maybe back again in the fall. A reminder that recordings are available on the MIX YouTube channel and on the internal UNICEF SharePoint site. With that, we wish you a very good day. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye, Thank everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.